Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast, a podcast about how to grow your business from $100,000 and beyond, and beyond in the land of the rising sun. Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast. I'm your host, Tyson Bettino. And on today's episode, we have Gerard Lai, a senior associate at MUFG Innovation Partners, the CVC arm of the well known Japanese bank. This is part two of our series on corporate venture capital. In part one, we interviewed Makoto Shibato of Fino Labs, and he gave a great introduction. And we look to go much deeper into the topic with Gerard today. It's great to have you on today. And could you please introduce yourself, Gerard? Right, sure. Thank you, Tyson, for having me on your podcast. It's my first time speaking on one, and I'm very happy to share what I can. So, just a quick introduction of myself. My name is Gerard, as Tyson mentioned. I'm originally from Singapore. I started off my career in the public sector in Singapore and came to Japan five years ago for my master's at the University of Tokyo. I'm currently with uh, MEFG Innovation Partners, as Tyson mentioned, or what we call MEIP in short. So MEIP is essentially the corporate venture capital arm of Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group, uh, which is a Japanese financial group with global presence. And I'm responsible for our strategic investment activities, mainly in Southeast Asia. Excellent. I am very excited to learn more about corporate venture capital. And because I think it's a very important topic for startup founders in Japan and those interested in entering the Japanese market. And to get started, we talked about it in our previous episode, but just to kind of get everyone warmed up to the topic. So, what makes CVC or corporate venture capital different from venture capital? Yeah, before going into the difference, right, between CVC and a normal financial focus VC, I think we need to first be clear about the fundamental similarity between CVCs and financial focus VCs. Because I think you can probably see them as you know being cut from the same cloth, but perhaps just with different patterns and color painted on them, right? So fundamentally, I think because they invest capital in venture as an asset class, they would expect some financial return from their investment. So now having set that similarity aside, I think the main difference between the CVC and the financial focus VC lies in the level of emphasis on financial return. So typically, I think the CVC will tend to have lower expectations on financial return multiples on their investor capital as compared right, to a purely financial focused VC. A related point to that is that um, the main aim that a CVC set out to achieve is actually to kind of foster strategic collaboration with startups, right? So I think there's this uh, delicate balance between strategic collaboration and financial returns. You know, some startups can be great for partnerships, but they may not generate high financial returns or some startups may have the potential to scale themselves. So they may not necessarily regard partnerships with corporates with that much importance, right? So I think CVCs usually have to consider that kind of balance, right, between the two aims. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Partners in the VC, their goal is to get return. But for the CVC case, of course, they don't want to just throw money away. Of course, they want to get returns. But because the, the main partner is uh, the corporate entity, they have that usage for the strategic side. Yes, absolutely. Now that we have an idea of what CVC is, I'm kind of curious how much do Japanese CVCs actually invest? Right. That's that's a tough question. But well, we did come across some data points recently, which I, I think I can share. So I, I think we saw that according to, you know, Startup DB, which is a research firm, I think the deal volume from CVCs in Japan has been increasing over the past few years, right? In fact, I think it has been rising from about 120 investments in 2017 to about 360 in 2021. So that constitutes about, I guess, three times growth in the span of five years. And then we recently saw another data point or research that is being done by PitchBook. So between the period of 2015 and 2022, Japanese CVCs actually invested in at least half of all the VC deals in Japan. Uh, and I think that peaked to around about 60 plus percent participation rate in 2020. So I think the upshot or the bottom line that we can probably draw right from these data points is that 
the CBCs of this cash-rich Japanese corporations, they do play a very strong and central role in the startup ecosystem in Japan, probably more so than in some other markets. So I think, you know, both domestic startups in Japan, as well as maybe foreign startups aiming to expand into market, probably cannot ignore them. And in fact, they may make for pretty good potential partners. That is interesting that it's, it's been growing uh, year over year, at least until we have the data for 2022. My next one is, uh, now that we know that CVC is very important, who are some of the big players in Japan? I think perhaps it would be useful for me to probably explain a little bit about how you know, corporates usually approach CVC programs in Japan. And they typically do so in two ways, right? And well, the first way that they do so is to develop a CVC in-house, uh, which means that the enterprise will establish either a subsidiary or fund and the fund will be managed by the CBC as the general partner or GP, and the parent enterprise may usually be the uh, limited partner, LP. And uh, it typically starts off with the parent enterprise as the sole LP, but uh, sometimes, you know, over time as the GP matures, other companies may also join as uh, LPs. So I think some of the more, you know, well-known examples in Japan will include firms like Do Docomo Ventures, uh, Cyber Agent, and of course us, MLG Innovation Partners. The other way that they would, will do so is to perhaps outsource the CVC function. And in doing so, I think they may collaborate with uh, either independent VCs or they could contract with a VC as a service provider. So some prominent examples in Japan, I think would be KDDI and maybe also Nodin Chukin Bank. So I think uh, some of your listeners may be pretty familiar with this name called Global Brain. They are kind of a classic example of a VC firm, you know, that helps uh, Japanese enterprises to manage their CVC funds. Uh, if you look at their website, I think they're already administering 14 funds uh, with companies such as KDDI and Mitsui Fudosan. So I think KDDI's flagship, you know, open innovation fund, I think that was done through partnership with Global Brain. And I believe Noreen Chicken Bank also has a partnership of a similar nature with them. Gotcha. I mean, I've heard of Global Brain, but I didn't know they're managing that many funds. Yeah, uh, I think they are doing pretty well, going from strength to strength, helping some of these uh, Japanese corporates to manage their PC programs. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing about those types of CVC players. And it, it makes sense that when the corporation is doing it for the first time, they usually try to get someone else to run it. Potentially, gradually, once they develop that knowledge, they'll start to run it themselves as the general partner or GP. Usually, the parent enterprises employees, they are not investment professionals, right? So, you know, having someone or a VC firm with the established investor and startup network, it's easier for them to source for deals, get co-investment opportunities that you know, maybe hard to come by from the start. And once they help to lift the program off the ground and going forward, they could either continue with a similar kind of approach or do it by, them, by themselves. 2023 is it's already August by now, and you presented some data about 2022, but uh, are there any unique changes to CVC investment in 2023 or 2024? Yeah, I think um, from what we see in the market so far, there probably has not been any observable unique changes to approaches to CVC investments. Uh, but one observation that we have made is that we have received more inbound requests right, from startups seeking strategic investors from startups looking to raise price equity rounds. Right? And one of the I guess, reasons for that would be due to the market downturn and therefore the fundraising conditions in relation to financial investors are probably not so favorable for the startups. And so, you know, strategic investors, of course, you know, CBCs could be subsumed under this category. They can add value by helping with the distribution of the startup's product. And so that's valuable to the startup that now do not have, you know, as easy of an access to the cash, right, for them to burn on customer acquisition. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, rather than just getting any type of capital, really getting strategic capital, getting enough traction where they can make it to the next round. You could see that as kind of like a, well, I guess, bridging approach, right? To obtain investments from strategic investors and then whether through the market downturn 
and possibly go for a bigger round once the market recovers. Yeah, and I think especially if you're doing something in Japan where your customer target is、uh, large Japanese corporations, having a CVC or like a CVC with a lot of connections or a CVC with its own like a selling department can go a real long way and save you a lot of time in expanding. Absolutely right about that. I think we can share a little bit of our experience later. One of the, the big questions I, I get to hear often is regarding、uh, CVC's investment style. But I guess do CVCs typically lead rounds? Yeah, I think I think that's a common question asked as well. And、um, what、well, the answer I guess is it's not typical for CVCs to lead rounds. In fact, I think according to some analysis that has been done by by the JVCA in Japan, as of twenty eighteen. You know, eighty percent of the Japanese CVC survey respondents to their survey indicated that they took a lead investor role in less than a quarter of their deals. Right, that essentially means that CVCs typically do not lead. And why is that? So I think you know, leading deals or leading investment deals typically would require more skills and time. And that's the first point. And the second point is that you know, CVCs value add in terms of. Helping startups with product distribution and the purpose of investment to is to derive strategic value instead of maximizing the share percentage and taking board seats, right? So there could be a few、uh, reasons that point to why CVCs do not typically lead. Gotcha. You can probably invest in potentially you could invest in more companies as well, and that would, for a long term, provide more strategic value. Yes, you're right. And maybe to add to that point is that. CVC funds,、uh, CVC fund sizes may、uh, be comparatively small, so you know doing a co-investment strategy could you know lower the entry level for CVCs as opposed to them leading rounds. One of the common challenges I see with my consulting clients is not having any staff internally who can drive marketing strategy and execution to the next level. This really limits the growth trajectory of a company, especially for a leader like you. That wants to go from 30 million to 500 million yen a year, and does not have the time to spend years learning through trial and error. To solve this problem, I am launching a marketing agency that can help companies like yours to increase leads and closing rates through SEO, Google Maps, content marketing, and websites that convert. Head over to scalingyourcompany.com and book a free consultation. Let's talk about what your business needs are. Where your current strategy is letting you down, and how we can help you see real results with the methods I've successfully implemented at multiple companies myself. Now back to the episode. So I think now that we know about board seats and leading rounds, oh,、uh, can you tell us more about stages? So, like, what type of stages do CVCs typically invest in? It really depends on the profile of CVCs. They invest in a pretty wide spectrum, from seed and early stages all the way to growth stages, right? So when it comes to growth stage companies, I think CVCs like to invest and work with these kind of companies because、uh, it is a comparatively the risk kind of approach for them to partner with growth stage companies, given that these would be companies that would have found product market fit, have showed a little bit of traction, and showed some track record. To say that their product is in demand in the market, right? But on the other hand, I think there are cases that exist where CVCs can also take a punt on earlier bets.、Uh, they could just deploy a small ticket size as kind of like a scout check for you know, new business models or new technologies that could potentially be disruptive, or it could potentially be a strong complement to the parent enterprise's existing core business. I think there's a good point. The more I dive deeper into VC and CVC, I think one point that I have to communicate with founders is that are all VCs and CVCs have their preferred areas, and pretty much in general, you know, they just stick to those areas. But there's just sometimes cases where some company is so great where、uh, it can't be ignored. Or like it's just such a match that they're going to bend a little bit, bend the rules a little bit on their typical investment behavior to take a punt on your company, but it's not common. And I think founders sometimes they have to be sometimes self-reflective if they're really like that special bet for that company. And I think more think that they're that special one than they are, 
And I think that can result in you wasting a lot of time of pitching people who aren't particularly interested. So I wanted to point out that it's best in general to stick to what they're looking for, unless you're really special. And you can tell that you're really, really special. You're just going to get so much attention. Mm -hmm. And everyone's yeah. going to be jumping on board. If people aren't jumping on board like crazy, then you're probably not that super special bet. <laughs> yep. um, I think that's a good point to make, Tyson. Maybe just to share a little bit, right? So MEIP, here at MEIP, we do have a, have a sweet spot. So Series B companies are kind of like our sweet spot. But in order to be, how to say, to not miss the boat of a special company, right? We can be pretty flexible. Uh, we can be flexible to go earlier to Series A companies or even later than B. Uh, depending on the round dynamics and depending on the market conditions. So I think that was a good point that you make that, you know, startup founders should bear in mind. I've seen some invest in seed round, but I think it's typically their focus was more on uh, returns as opposed to a strategic. So I think if the CVC is strategic, my guess would be you probably have to be more growth stage. But if the CVC is more just to generate returns, they might actually, even though it's a corporation, it might actually be a VC and you might just mistakenly think it's a CVC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think our, our observations to market are kind of aligned on that point. Cool. But yeah, thanks for sharing uh, your sweet spot. So if anyone's interested, now you know. And so I guess the next question would be like, how much do CVCs in Japan typically invest? Like the previous question, there's, there's no clear answer. We can't do a broad generalization to this, but it depends on the profile of the CVCs, right? Because there is a wide investment spectrum, as I talked about earlier. And so the ticket sizes that, you know, CVCs deploy would correspond accordingly to the investment stages that they deploy in, right? Again, maybe just to give a quick example of uh, MUIP's ticket sizes. For us, I think it's a wide range of between you no, know, one to 20 million USD. But uh, according to our track record and how we have invested so far, each time we deploy is on average three to five million USD. And I also get asked this quite a bit, but uh, do Japanese CVCs invest in companies from overseas? Oh yes, absolutely. Japanese CVCs definitely invest in companies from overseas. And this is especially so for Japanese corporates that have a global reach or scale. And having that would likely lift the geographic limitations on making investments, right? So I think one important consideration that they have would be, you know, to obtain access to the diverse types of innovation in the form of both technology and business models that exist outside of Japan that one would otherwise not see in Japan, right? For us here at MEIP, we do actively invest in overseas companies. And if you look at our website, and you can find that maybe 70 to 80% of our portfolio companies that we work with are non-Japanese. So we do keep a very active eye on, com on companies in the US and Israel for you know, the latest cutting edge technology and new business models. At the same time, I think you know, Asia Pacific, uh, which we consider as our second mother market after Japan, uh, is also important. So you know, Southeast Asia and India are you know, growth markets for us to tap on. And they may even provide innovation transfer potential for us, right? Well, having said that, I think we naturally also actively look for opportunities in Japan as our home market. Just because we invest overseas doesn't mean that the home market is neglected, right? And I think why we do so is because for starters, there's no language or cultural barrier when pursuing investment opportunities domestically, especially in Japan. And so it's easier to conduct due diligence on the team and the business model, right? And an extension to that is that with this lack of barriers, it's also comparatively easier for strategic collaboration to be achieved. Yeah, I was really surprised to hear that uh, 70 to 80% of uh, your portfolio companies are uh, non-Japanese. I was expecting it to be maybe more like a 50-50. And no, thanks for explaining some different regions and the reasons uh, why you're interested in it. So I guess now that we know a bit about MUIP as well and uh, CVCs and what you try to invest on, I think the next question I kind of want to focus on is like getting investment from a CVC. What is the best way to approach a CVC? I guess the best way to say it is that CVCs will function probably not much differently from other VCs in this regard. 
So usually there'll be two kinds of approaches, right? So both outbound in terms of, you know, startup events or industry events that CVCs will also attend, like with any other VCs. And CVCs, including us, we will also respond to inbound approaches, such as through LinkedIn messages or even warm referrals from the startup or investor network. So this would be usual ways that anybody could use to approach CVCs. I have a, a few CVC friends. They went to the IVS Kyoto event. And uh, I know some are going to be going to Startup DV is doing, I think it's called like Growth Conference in November 2023. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those looking to meet CVCs, this episode will be released before that November event. But check it out, Growth Conference in November. And uh, this question will probably be a bit similar as well. But what is the best way to make a good impression? I think we, we can see this as kind of, take for example, if you were going for an interview, I think you can uh, approach that in the same kind of manner. So you'll be able to make a good impression if you have already done research on the sectors of interest of the CVC, which will allow you to engage the discussion in a more productive manner. And I think uh, it's also good to have a clear idea of what kind of uh, mutual value that each party can bring to the table. Essentially, then this will show that, you know, the startup company does not really just want the name of the big corporation on the cap table, but you know, they would generally want to collaborate. And that's something that we look out for in terms of the you know, stance towards collaboration with the parent enterprise. Is this information typically on the CVC website or probably recommend checking both the CVC and the parent company? Some CVC's website, CVC websites may not provide too much information. But uh, it's always good to cast the, white, the, the net wider to check both the CVC's website and the parent enterprise's website. So that's a good point, Tyson. Curious, uh, so how do CVC's evaluate a company? On this, I think there is the part where there is not much difference from typical VC, and there's also the part where there's a difference, right? So for the part where it's similar, I think like with typical VCs, uh, CVC's will look for three main categories, right? Which is one market, whether it's a big enough market and there's a clear problem to solve. Two, product, right? Whether, you know, it's a market leading solution, do users want to pay for it? And is there a competitive mode to the, to the product? And in terms of team, whether the team has a relevant skills to steer the ship of the startup and beyond just leadership of, of the startup management team, whether they show a collaborative stance with the, how to say, parent enterprise of the CBC. Putting that aside, for the part where there's a difference, I think we need to add on a layer, right? Is there a, the question here would be, is there a collaboration hypothesis with this company for the CVC? And the CVC will also likely think, is there going to be a mutual value add right, between the two parties? Because entering in the partnership is going to be a two-way street. It's not, it will not be one party benefiting from the other only. In our previous interview with Makoto Shibata, he said something that really made me get it, but uh, how he described it was, I think in the past, CVCs did try investing in, you know, earlier stage companies like pre-seed and seed stage companies, but they didn't really know how they could effectively help them because sometimes the companies were just too early, you know, to introduce to their corporate partners. Mm -hmm. And so it was really hard for them. Like they wanted to help out, but you know, it was really hard for them to support them strategically. So it kind of makes sense that that's why it's uh, that collaboration hypothesis, but also why CVCs are now tend to invest more in growth stage companies. Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to the point that you mentioned earlier in terms of if the CVC has a, is leaning towards strategic collaboration as a goal, then growth stage companies will make more sense in terms of investments. But if they were to uh, also be after financial returns, then taking an earlier bet on earlier stage companies, uh, even though the strategic collaboration angle may not be present, it could still make sense for them. Thank you for listening to this episode of Scaling Japan. In addition to serving as your fine host, I also provide advisory and coaching services to business owners who want to 2x, 5x, and even 10x their business. So stop holding your company and your team and your employees back and let me help you and your company scale. Find more information at scalingyourcompany.com. 
gmail.com. Now back to the episode. And also I'm kind of curious because there's the corporate layer with the CVC, or I guess for context, I guess in a VC, typically partners or like a group of partners would make the final decision. But how does the investment decision work in a CVC? So for this, it also differs from CVC to CVC. There will be some organizations that provide full autonomy to the CVC. And so they make the decision uh, entirely by themselves. And so that could expedite the process in terms of investment decision. In cases where strategic collaboration is also a consideration, then sometimes there could be a senior executive from the parent organization that may be involved. So there are probably pros and cons to this kind of approach, right? So the pros is that uh, given that there is, how to say, the parent organization is most likely going to be a more hierarchical organization compared to the VC or the startup. And so, you know, having management buy-in could help to smoothen the conversation on a working level on collaboration discussions, right? But on the other hand, uh, that could mean, you know, comparatively slower decision-making process, right? So as you mentioned, in a VC, you could have a general partner who can make the decision by himself, or it could be a team of partners who come to the decision uh, after discussion. So in the case of the CVC, if you add another layer uh, for the decision-making process, that would most likely slow down the process because I think with more people involved, it's harder to schedule time for one. And secondly, I think you know, it could also take a little while uh, to get the executive from the parent organization to be you know, familiar with the startup process, be familiar with the evaluation process. So I think how experienced the, the internal staff member is uh, and how familiar they are with the process can make a big difference. And uh, for startup founders who are able to access this kind of information, then they'll be you know, well-placed to kind of access whether they're uh, CVC can move quickly or will be slow in the process. Yeah, that's some excellent feedback. And probably for the newer startup founders out there, you can probably just ask some, one of your friends who are more experienced uh, in terms of raising funds, and they can probably help you kind of figure out maybe how experienced the person supporting you is. I'm sure it's probably very similar, but I'll ask anyways for pitch decks and like, you know, doing pitches to CVCs, uh, are there any differences compared to a VC? Yes, again, I think a CVC would, would like to see the same things as a VC, typical VC, which is a very compelling story and or, or narrative about the market, product and team. And that's probably fundamental. But I think, you know, what really set the pitch apart will be extra effort, which is dedicated to preparing a slide on collaboration ideas, right? And it actually doesn't have to be that long. It could simply just be a slide that really just summarizes the ideas. And having that would really show effort on the part of the startup in terms of having carefully thought through some of these collaboration ideas, right? And show that it's not just on a, the discussion is not just going to be on an ad hoc basis. And in addition to that, uh, I think what's very helpful would be, you know, with this slide on the collaboration ideas it can also provide the investor that you're speaking to, ideas on how to broach the collaboration topic uh, internally with the relevant stakeholders, right? So essentially having that will help the investor to make an internal case for you. Cool, excellent advice. And I guess, yeah, and my one more question is, how long does the due diligence phase typically take? It is a wide spectrum. It could range from <laughs> two months to half a year to even a year. I think it really depends on a few variables, including dynamics of the round, market conditions, and so on. So yeah. Yeah, and I think for the founders listening, probably the best way it's just asking other founders, maybe in a similar industry, and that can kind of give you an indicator of how the market has impacted it. And uh, yeah, I guess before we finish off, I do want to get to know a little bit more about MUFG Innovation Partners as well. And I think the listeners are curious as well. So for MUFG, the parent company itself, like what were some of its goals for creating the CVC arm? I think the main aim is to foster open innovation between startups and MUFG Financial Group, right? So we formed the CVC arm, which is MUFG Innovation Partners, uh, in order for us, or rather the MUFG financial group to gain exposure to you know, innovative business models and technology that can 
potentially transform the financial sector, the MEFG is squarely in, right? More importantly, I think this new technology should also create real value for society. And yes, like because I know MEFG Innovation Partners have invested in non-fintech startups. Is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. So, you know, given that we have roots in financial services, I think it's not surprising that one would think fintech and even fintech adjacent companies would be, you know, on the top of our minds when it comes to collaboration and investments. But at the same time, I think, you know, in terms of uh, maybe startups which provide products as platforms, marketplaces, as well as, you know, it could be digital tools and, and enablers that are provided on a SaaS basis where essentially if financial services can be embedded, this kind of companies would also be of interest to us. And uh, I know you have several funds, but can you tell us about the funds that you have? We're currently administering three funds. Uh, the first two are what we call flagship funds, and they have a pretty global mandate. So the geographies in which we invest in would be uh, US, Israel, Africa, and coming near to home would be India, Oceania, Southeast Asia, and of, of course, Japan. That would be the two first two flagship funds. And we recently launched uh, a third fund called the Garuda Fund in January this year. And that's a Indonesia focused fund, which is meant for fostering open innovation between startups and our partner bank in Indonesia called Bank Dalamon. And apart from these three funds that we administer ourselves, we are also actively working together with the MEFG team that administers the Ganesha Fund. Uh, the Ganesha Fund is uh, MEFG's India Focus Fund, and we assist the team on a wide range of activities, uh, including deal sourcing, market research, and so on. Also, I'm curious though, what are some of the success cases of MUIP? How we see success is in terms of, you know, whether or not we can foster some successful partnership together with the startups to possibly provide a new product or, in, or distribute the product in the market. So I think fundamentally, startups can probably see MEIP as the ultimate gateway to two things, right? And first is being a gateway to the relevant business units of MSG Bank, as well as our network of four partner banks in Southeast Asia. So within our team, we have personnel who have experience working in the parent organization. And there are also others who have experience working on digital transformation projects as consultants. And so they would serve as a bridge between startups and relevant MEFG group entities. So maybe I'll just give you an example here. So in 2019, MEFG, we first invested in Liquidity Capital, which is a startup from Israel. And they make use of a unique, pretty unique uh, credit scoring model, which is based on AI tech, as well as, you know, some accounting data to forecast future earnings and cash flow. So we bridged Liquidity Capital with the relevant units within the MEFG. And thankfully after, you know, some positive discussions, uh, that gave birth, right, to a partnership, which really is kind of a first of its kind, right? And what I'm referring to is a joint venture between MEFG Bank and Liquidity Capital. Uh, and that's in the form of Mars Grove Capital Base in Singapore. So for those who are not familiar with Mars Grove Capital, they provide that funding, uh, that financing for startups. Right now, mainly in Asia Pacific, but uh, possibly, you know, expanding to more markets later. So that's the first. And the second is that we are essentially kind of like a gateway to partnership opportunities within MEFG's wide network of corporate clients, right? Which I think Tyson, you mentioned earlier. So I think here I can just quickly share two examples. And the first is Ripcord, uh, which is a startup from the US. And it's a very unique company that uses a combination of robotics hardware, software, and AI, and the digitalized paper records. Uh, quickly at scale and make them very easily searchable, right, on the cloud. So MEFG Bank, so for, for the Japanese listeners, right, or foreign residents living in Japan, you know, they would most likely know this. Uh, MEFG Bank has many paper documents or what they call hanko forms. So these are produced when customers open bank accounts. And hanko, for those that are uninitiated, are physical seals or stamps that are personalized to individual names and they are widely used for admin documents in Japan in the pre-COVID era. So MFG partners with Ripcord to increase the productivity and efficiency by automating this you know, digitization process of the Hanko documents. And so they make the data that they contain you know, searchable on, on the digital basis, right? 
So we believe that you know the digitization of paper documents is quite a prevalent need for corporates across different sectors, right? Both in Japan and in other markets. So we hope that MEFG can serve as a lighthouse use case, right? And refer record to provide a similar kind of digitalization service to MEFG's clients, both in the financial sector and beyond that. And then quickly just on the next example, I have a second example to share, which is Move, which is a startup from Nigeria, Africa. That company, Move, provides vehicle fiat financing and other financial services to mobility entrepreneurs, right? And this is based on their alternative credit scoring tech. So I think mobility entrepreneurs may also be known in, in some other markets, such as in other terms, right? Such as gig workers, right? Who provide right hitting services mm. on right hitting platforms, right? Like Uber, Lyft, or Grab. So I think MEIP together with MEFG Bank, MEFG Bank, they facilitated discussions with Suzuki, which is a global vehicle manufacturer. Uh, there's also a client to bank. So after that, subsequently in 2022, the three parties, which is MOVE, Suzuki and MEFG Bank, they proceeded to sign a tri-party agreement for collaboration. Those are the you know examples of success cases where we have you know fostered successful partnerships with, with the startups that we work with. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I think this has been a really good uh, interview, and I think with a combination of part one with Makoto and uh, part two with Gerard here, I think we have a pretty good understanding now of what CVC does, what they like, how to approach them, and also uh, the numbers involved mm-hmm. with deal size and more. So yeah, this has been really educational for me. And do you have any last messages? I think today we talked quite a bit about CVC's corporates and the preferences, right? So, but beyond these heavy topics, I think it might be worth remembering that, you know, just stripping away the corporate layer or the corporate name that they represent. I think the people working at CVCs are at the end of the day, human beings like uh, Tyson and I. So it'd be good to treat the interaction as one with a human being with mutual respect and not be too preoccupied, right? With the organization name at the back. And finally, I think, you know, once again, I would like to thank you for having me, Tyson. And I do hope that the insights that we share today will be very helpful for your listeners. And just to, you know, shamelessly give a plug here, right? If there are any startups or businesses <laughs> that are looking to partner with us, right, to provide innovative you know, financial services and you want to promote access to, you know, appropriate financial services, feel free to reach out to our team. We'll be more than happy to catch up. Yeah, that is an interesting point that you mentioned. And I, I could see because of the corporate name, people approaching you differently than they would approach a VC. I know you probably couldn't give specific examples of kind of like weird ways that people have treated you before, but I would just use my imagination. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Uh, But no, that's an interesting point. And thinking about it, it makes perfect sense that some people might do that. Cool. Uh, Thank you very much, Gerard. Thank you, Tyson.